Hello? So, uh, so before we talk about the exponential function, uh, we're going to talk about that in relation to the log function, you know, the logarithm function, which is the inverse, right? And so before we can talk about exponential functions, we should, we should review briefly what we mean by uh, an inverse of a function, right? So the inverse function, right? So, so you have a function g, right? So this is, the, this is the, the definition right here. We have a function g is the inverse of a function f if f composed with g, right? So f of g of x is equal to g of f of x, and they're both equal to x, right, on their respective domains, right? And in this case, we can write uh, g of x, we usually write it as f inverse of x, and by now you know that when you write f inverse of x, uh, right, that this negative 1, of course, is not an exponent. We know that, right, so this is not 1 over f of x, right? So it's not the reciprocal, right? So this is not an exponent, right? So the way we read this is f inverse of x, right? f inverse, right? So don't say f to the negative 1. That's not what it means, right? Right. So, so what is the inverse of a function, right? It's basically the function that undoes the other function, right? So, so in particular, I'm thinking of, of this here as just telling you that if you take f of f inverse, you just get x, and if you take f inverse of f, you just get x. Um, so maybe a, a trivial example here might be, suppose f of x is just, uh, oops, suppose f of x is, uh, I don't know, how about 3 times x, right? Well, what function undoes that, right? So instead of multiplying by 3, we think of the inverse of that as maybe dividing by 3, right? So let's check this condition here. If we take uh, f, let's, yeah, let's do f inverse of f first. Let's see that f inverse in some ways cancels f, right? So what does f inverse do to x? It divides it by 3. So what does it do to f of x? It just divides it by 3. Now, what's f of x? Well, it's defined to be 3x. Well, 3x divided by 3 is indeed x, as promised, right? Um, let's go the other way. Let's say we have, uh, we want to take f of f inverse of x. So what does f do to x? It multiplies it by 3. What does it do to inverse? It just multiplies f inverse of x by 3. Okay, so what's f inverse? Well, it's just x divided by 3. So once again, you have the right 3x divided by 3, which is just x. So it works both ways up here, right? Um, in the sense that if you take right, f of f inverse or f inverse of f, you just get x, right? And I, I know you all know this. This, is, this should be a review, but it's, uh, it, it's very crucial that you understand the meaning of the inverse of a function. And in, partic in this context here in particular, um, that, you know, that they, they just cancel each other out, right? Okay. And of course, we can get into, you know, this was a pretty easy example because both of these functions have the same domain that's all real numbers for both, right? So maybe later we'll get into a less trivial example. Um, or actually, let's, let's do that now, maybe. Um, right, so here's another example. Suppose f of x is, uh, let's make it the square root of x minus 4. So what's the inverse? Well, yeah, so maybe, maybe this is a good time to, uh, to bring up how do you find the inverse, right? Because in the first example, it was more or less obvious, right? You know, the inverse of multiplying by 3 is dividing by 3, and vice versa. If, you have, if f of x was x over 3, the inverse would be, you know, x times 3, 
Um, but here it might not be completely obvious. Um, I mean, you know, for some of you it might be, but uh, maybe not for all of you, right? So to find the inverse, um, the first step, right, so to find the inverse, right, given the original function. So first, instead of writing f of x, we'll just write y instead of f of x. Right, so step one just looks like this. This is y equals the square root of x minus 4. Right, and now, right, the process of finding the inverse, you're really just switching the x's and y's, right? So switch or interchange x and y. In other words, everywhere you see an x, change it to y. Everywhere you see a y, change it to x. Right. And then the last step is to now write it as a function of x. So in other words, solve for y as a function of x. All right, so let's do that. Um, well, let's just switch sides, right? This is the square root of y minus 4 equals x supposed to be an x, right? Uh, so to undo the square root, um, you know you have to square both sides. So you square the left side, or square the right side, and square the left side, and that square cancels the square root, so you just get y minus 4 equals x squared, and then finally just add the 4 to both sides. So let me pull it down a little bit here, you should get y equals x squared plus 4, right? And so that should be the inverse. Um, yep, I'll, I'll just write it up here. f inverse of x is x squared plus 4. OK, um, but maybe we should very roughly here draw, draw their graphs. Um, again, forgive the sloppiness here. Let's start with. The original function, x squared of x minus 4. So you should recognize that as just being shifted left, or so, shifted right, 4 units. And then, so I'm not going to do this all that carefully, right? You know what the square root function looks like. It looks something like this, right? So this is the square root of x minus 4. It's just the square root function, right? This thing here, shifted, shifted right. Four units. Right, so this is x equals four. Right. All right. What about the inverse function? All right. So square uh, x squared plus four is just x squared shifted up one, two, three, four, sp four spaces. Let's try that again. So that looks something like this. Except you see that that's not quite right. Right. After all. Uh, usually the inverse is just a reflection over the line y equals x. So if you were to reflect this through the line y equals x, you should get the inverse. So when you do that, you get this. Right? Yep. You don't get this, this piece of it here. Right? So so yeah, so what's missing here from this is the fact that the, the domain implicitly would be all real numbers, but the domain here has to be non-negative numbers, right? From zero to infinity. Okay, yep, so we're not, we're not considering what happens when x is less than zero. Make sense? Yeah, if you go back to uh, well, okay, so I'm running out of space here. Uh, what's the range of this function? So if you look at the y values, the lowest y value is 4, so we're starting at 4 and going up right, to infinity. Right? So from 4 to infinity. Now if you look at the original function, not the inverse, but the original, square root of x minus 4, and you look at its domain and range, you should see the opposite, right? In other words, for the domain, x is going to be bigger than or equal to 4. 
And for the range, y is going to be bigger than or equal to 0. So you see what happens. The domain and ranges get switched when you find the inverse, right? Sorry to cross out the, the original function here, but it's, it's up here as well. It's on the upper left, right? So yeah, so the domain of the inverse is the range of the original function, and the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function, right? OK, so, so yeah, a perfectly good example where the domains and ranges just get switched, right? And that happened in example one as well, but it's less clear because the domain and the range for the original function was all real numbers. So of course, for the inverse function, the domain and range will be you know, all real numbers. So, so that doesn't really tell you anything, anything new, right? that both domains and ranges are all real numbers. Here, that's not the case, right? You have a different domain from the range, so they get switched. OK, um, so another thing, and this is, uh, let's see. Yep, so, so that's what I just stated right here. The domain of the inverse, right, is the range of the original function. And the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function, right? In other words, when you find the inverse, you're not just switching x and y, right? You're not just switching the x and y here. You're also switching, sorry, I'm using a dark, dark pen here, right? In step two, you, you switch the x and y's. And so you're also switching um, the domain and range, right? OK, so the next thing I want to focus on here uh, is this property here. This is theorem 5.6 in, in our book. Uh, corresponding points on the, on the graph of the inverse, right? So if you have a point, let's say, instead of using x and y, we're going to use a and b here. Um, well, you probably know why, because pretty soon we're going to switch the x's and y's. It's going to get pretty confusing to call them x and y, because you get, they get switched. And wh which, which is it, x or y, right? So f we'll use a and b for the coordinates of a point. On the inverse, of course, because you're switching the domain and range, you're switching the x and y, you're switching a and b. Right? So let's look at the graph, and we can see why that's going to happen here. On the original function here, we have the point x equals 5, y equals 1. But when you go across the line y equals x, on the inverse, this corresponding point will now be x equals 1, y equals 5, right? So, so here a is 5, b is 1, and now b is 1, a is 5, right? So same a and b here, right? So yeah, you, you're just switching the x's and y's. You're switching the coordinates of the point when you get the inverse, OK? Again, this, this should all be mostly review, um, at least I'm hoping. Um, but it, again, it's it's very important you you get you get this um, pretty soon. We're going to get uh, more deep into inverses, in particular, of course, their derivatives. So, um, so this final property here, theorem five point seven, just tells us when do we have a, an inverse function. We have an inverse function if and only if f is one to one, and if you have a strictly monotonic function, that means either increasing or decreasing on its domain, then it's one-to-one, -one, right? So hopefully you remember what one-to-one -one means. Um, but if not, I, of course, I will remind you. So I'm going to scroll way down here. Right? So f is called one-to-one. -one, right? If... Well, there's a lot of ways you can state this, this as a definition, but I think the way I like to state it is for every, for every y, um, right, there is only one x, so one corresponding x. Right, I should say value of x, right? For every value of y, right, there is only one corresponding value of x. Right. So we can write that the following way. We can say that if we have, let's say, f of a equals f of b, the only way that can happen is if a equals b. So 
right? If you have the same y value, you have to have the same x value. Or you can state what's called the contrapositive. If a does not equal b, then we know for sure that f of a does not equal f of b, right? So what's a good example of a one-to-one -one function? Well, there's many, but let's just take our first example, maybe uh, this, I think this is example three, but I'm just going to go back to example one, f of x equals 3x. So 3 times x, right? So yeah, this is, this is going to be one-to-one, -one, and you can check, um, right, f of a equals f of b, well, that would state that 3 times a equals 3 times b. But if 3 times a equals 3 times b, just divide by the 3, and that tells us that a has to equal b, right? So this is definitely 1 to 1. Uh, little shortcut there. 1 to 1. Uh, that's supposed to be an O. Okay. All right, so yeah. So this is a good example of a one-to-one -one function. What's not a good example of a one-to-one -one function, or what's an example of something that's not one-to-one? -one? How about, oh, I shouldn't call it g. That's confusing. How about f? So f of x equals, well, let's just do x squared minus 4. All right, this is not definitely not one-to-one. -one. Not one-to-one. Well, we should specify it's not one-to-one -one on its domain, the domain being all real numbers, right? So we're considering the domain of all real numbers here, right? And, of course, if you look at the graph, let me do that way over here. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. All right, close enough. All right, so the graph will look something like this. Let me try that again. All right. Hey, I'm rushing. Let me, let me try it like this. Okay. All right, so this is supposed to be a very sloppy graph of y equals x squared minus 4. Okay, so why is it not one-to-one? -one? Well, all right, if you look at, let's say, y equals 5 up here. This is y equals 5, right? So when you set this equal to 5 and you solve for x, what do you get? All right, so if you add 4 to both sides, you get x squared equals 9. So that tells us that x equals 3. So this point down here should be x equals 3, so this point is 3, 5. Of course, I pulled a fast one on you here. If x squared is 9, right, x is 3 or negative 3, right? When you take the square to both sides, don't forget the plus or minus squared of 9. So plus 3 and negative 3. So yep, over here, x is negative 3, so we get negative 3, 5. Okay, and so that violates the definition of 1 to 1 here, right? For every y, let's say y equals 5, as an example, there's only one corresponding x. Well, here's the violation of that. We have two corresponding x's. Both negative 3 and positive 3 have the same y, y equals 5, right? So definitely not, not 1 to 1. And so when you're looking at the graph, of course, it's very easy to tell. All you have to do is draw a horizontal line, and if the graph crosses that horizontal line more than once, right, in particular twice, or three times or four times, then it's not one-to-one, -one, right? So that's the, the usual horizontal line test. Okay, test, not text, right? So the horizontal line test if any horizontal line crosses more than once, it is not one-to-one. -one. Or you can say, as in the case of, say, you can graph this function, it's just a straight line. Um, yeah, well, it's, you know, very roughly the, the line looks like this. 
and you can see that every horizontal line crosses only once. If every horizontal line crosses only once, then it is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so as a warning, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to clear all this, and then we'll just start over. Right? Okay. So I'm going to focus on now when you find the inverse, how do you take the derivative? And here we go. So this down here tells us the answer of what's the derivative of the inverse. So it's just the reciprocal of the derivative applied to the inverse. Okay, so if that's a little confusing, let's take a step back and first um, let's look at the, the, this property here, which, which will help. You have a function whose domain is some interval, we'll call it i, and let's say the function is one-to-one. -one. That means it has an inverse, right? It, well, it has an inverse function. Right, so if f is continuous, then so is the inverse, right? At least on their respective domains, right? And if the domain of f is, is i, then the inverse will just be the image of i, right? Um, if f is increasing on i, then the inverse is also increasing. And if f is decreasing, the inverse is also decreasing. Okay, so all of that should make sense if you go back and look at the previous examples. I think both the, the functions were increasing, and so the, the inverses were also increasing. Um, but the reverse would also be true. If the function f is decreasing, right, then the inverse will also be, be decreasing in some way, right? All right. In any event, the important thing here is this last one. If f is differentiable, right, on its domain, right, and let's say the domain contains some value of x, we'll call it c here, and the derivative of f at c is not zero, then we can say the function is differentiable at f of c, right? The inverse function is differentiable at the image point, right? In other words, the y-coordinate of c, right? Okay, so if a function is differentiable, that means we can take its derivative, and as long as the, the as long as c is not a critical number, right? In other words, the derivative is not zero at c, then the inverse will also be differentiable. And so that means we can take its derivative, right? And so here's the answer at the bottom, but let's see why that's true. So let me go back to, to the following. Let's say that g of x is the inverse of f. Okay, inverse of f. Right. So, right, so instead of saying f inverse, uh, I'm just going to call it g again. We did that earlier, so it makes more sense. You can, and, and when, you look at the, when you look at this on the upper right here, it does look a little confusing. And so to make it a little less confusing, we're going to derive this version on the left over here. But they're equivalent as long as you recognize that f inverse is just another name for g. Um, okay. All right. So what do we know about f and g? Well, we know from earlier that if we take um, f of g of x, that we just get x, right? We also know that if we take g of f of x, we get x, right? And so I think it's this bottom one we want to, we want to use here. Um, if we take the derivative of both sides, right? So we're going to take the derivative of the left. Yep. And we need to take the derivative of the right side. So this is just implicit differentiation, right? Well, we know the derivative of x is just 1. So this is going to be 1 on the right. What do we have on the left? Well, we have the derivative of g composed with f, g of f of x, right? So this is perfect for the chain rule, right? We need to apply the chain rule here when you're taking the derivative of a function of another function. And the chain rule says we're going to take the derivative of g, 
right, at f, and then multiply by the derivative of f. And I think I just realized I wanted the other. I wanted to use this version. Um, so th this version is true, of course, but it's not the one we wanted here. So while all this is true, let's 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 hold on to that thought for just a minute here. Um, I did want this version up here. Okay, so we're still going to apply the chain rule to this, right? So hang on, let me let me just uh, get rid of this, and then we'll come back and do it correctly. Yeah, again, nothing I did was wrong there. It's just it's just not helpful because you're expressing well. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's let's just let's just apply the chain rule here, right? So we're going to take the derivative of both sides of this version. But of course, it's done the same way. We still need the chain rule here. And then the derivative of x is still 1, right? So this equals 1. And what do we have on the left here? So this is going to be the derivative of f applied to g of x times the derivative of g of x. Right, so that's prime here, right? right. So what that, if we want to solve for the derivative of g, I can just divide both sides by the derivative of f applied to g. Hmm. Right. So that cancels on the left and on the right. Right. So we get the derivative of g is equal to 1 over the derivative of f, not at x, but at g of x. So there we go. If you look, this is what we have over here, right? So, so if this should not be as mysterious right now, it's just applying the chain rule, right? And if you change g of x to f inverse, right? If you change this to f inverse now, what you get is the following statement, right? You have the inverse function, f, and now we want to take the derivative of that at x. This is just going to be the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function, f, applied not to x, but to the inverse, f inverse of x. Okay. Right. And then, of course, that's just this version up here. Right. So, so there you go, right? That's the basically deriving this theorem 5.9, or, or maybe you know, proving it using the, the chain rule here, right? So yeah, this is going to take some getting used to, right? What, do, what does this really mean here, right? So, right so, so what's the meaning of this? Again, this is where it really helps to look at an example. So we'll look at an example in a particular graph. Once you have the, the picture, the graph, it, it'll make more sense. So, so let's do that now. Okay, so here's the example I have in mind. And this is, this is actually the example we did earlier. Um, so, you know, just to reiterate, we have the original function f is the square root of x minus 4, right? Or I should say the square root of x minus 4. So x minus 4 is under the square root, right? And then the inverse, as we found, you know, through that process, step by step, we found the inverse is x squared plus 4 on, on the domain 0 to infinity. Again, we have to say that because otherwise we would assume that we can plug in any x, negative or positive, here. But as you can see from the picture, from the graph on the right here, uh, the domain of this is only, the domain of the inverse, right, is only x greater than or equal to 0. So, yeah. We have to state the explicit domain here um, because, of course, otherwise we would assume that we can plug in positive or negative x, and that's just not the case in this, in this case here. Right? Okay, um, yeah, so, uh, so now we want to look at a particular point here. Let's go on the original function f at the point 5, 1, right? And you can, you can check that if x is 5, right? then y is 1, 5 minus 4 is 1, square root of 1 is 1, right? But what I'm interested in now is what is the slope of the tangent line at this point? So we can see that, right, this is a differentiable function. It has 
that's not quite right. Let me try that again. Okay, that's a little better. We have some tangent line here. Right at the point five one. Okay, so what's the slope of that line? Well, it's going to be the derivative of the function when you plug in five. Right, so at x equals five, what's the, the slope, right, the m? Okay, so let's do that, right? Let's take the derivative of the original function f. So to do that, well, we probably should write this as x minus four to the one half, so we can apply the power rule, right? Oops, sorry, one half times x minus 4 to the negative 1 half, and then don't forget the chain rule, the derivative of x minus 4 is 1 minus 0. So if you forget the chain rule here, you lucked out because the derivative of this is 1, but you know, it's not always, right? If this were x squared minus 4, you'd have to multiply by 2x and so on, right? Right, so another way to write this is it's just 1 over 2 times the square root of x minus 4. So it's slightly more convenient. So now when we plug in our, our number here, x equals 5, right? What do we get? We get 1 over 2 times the square root of 5 minus 4, which is 1 over 2 times the square root of 1, which is, right, which is 1, so 1 over 2, right? So that's the slope of this line here. It's 1 half. Whether, whether that looks right or not, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty close, right? It's a slope of one half, right? Rise over run. Right. So for every one unit you go up, you go two units to the right. Make sense? Okay, right? So now the question is, what is going to be the slope of the tangent line on the inverse function? Right? Not at x equals 5, which, well, x equals 5 is going to be way above the scale here. Right? We're going through the roof. Um, you know, well, yeah, we can, we, can, we can plug in f inverse of 5 is going to be 25 plus 4 is 29, which is way up there. Right? That's not where we want to do this. We want to do this at the corresponding point. Right? We want to do this at the point 1, 5. So when x equals 1, right? Okay, right, and yes, so you can check f inverse of 1 is just 1 squared plus 4, which is 5. But what we want to do now is find the derivative of the inverse at 1. What's the slope of this line here? Um, well, let me try to draw the line. Okay, not the best, but uh, pretty close, pretty close. Oh wait, you know what? I just realized it is wrong, so let me let me go back and fix it. Okay, that's a little better. It's a little better, right? So, yep, our goal is to find the slope of this line. And we know how to do that, right? We have our we have our function. This is the definition, right? And 1 is certainly bigger than 0, right? So, we just have to find the derivative of that. Um, so let me do that down here now. So we want to find the derivative of the inverse prime at x equals 1, but let's plug that in later, right? We'll just find this for any x. So we do it the same way. We just take the derivative of x squared plus 4, and you can do that in your sleep, right? This is just 2x plus 0, right? So the derivative is 2x. Right? Now to get the slope of this, this purple line here, now we just have to plug in to the inverse, not x equals 5, right? This is at x equals 1 here. So this is just 2 times 1, which is 2. So there you have it, right? So, the, so this question mark up here is now 2. Yep, so I think we can definitively say the slope of this tangent line is 2, right? Or, put another way, right, the rise over run, it's 2 over 1, right? 
which is the reciprocal, right? The reciprocal of the other line, right? One over two of, of this green line here. So the slope of these two lines are reciprocal. Instead of one over two, we get two over one, right? And when you look at this condition, well, now it makes sense, right? Either condition here, right? In order to find the derivative of the inverse, you just take the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function, plugging in the corresponding point here. In this case, instead of plugging in x equals 1, you're plugging in the y value here, right, which is the x value here. Remember, for the inverse, you switch x and y. So, so, so I hope that helps a little bit explain, explain this property here, um, right? So in retrospect, we didn't have to do this down here, although it wasn't that difficult to do. What we could have done is just take this, this slope here, the one half, and just flipped it over. Instead of one over two, you get, right, two over one. Right? So that's what this property up here on the right says that you can do. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So, so, so I hope that helps. Um, again, we'll do another example to explain this uh, because I know it's a little confusing at first. Um, but what, once you get used to it, the idea is to find the derivative of the inverse. All you need to do is take the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function. Right. But here we found it directly, right? We just found the inverse, and then we found its derivative, and we got you know, 2x, and then we plugged in the x equals 1. Okay, so here's our next example. We have a function, f of x is just cosine of x, right? It's the familiar cosine function from trigonometry, nothing new there. And we're restricting the domain to 0 to pi. And Perhaps you, you probably know why, right? Because if we don't restrict it to this domain, then it's not one-to-one. -one. And then we cannot meani meaningfully talk about the inverse function, then, right? It wouldn't be a function. It would be a relation. So by restricting the domain to this, right, we get g of x being our inverse function, right? And hopefully you remember what the inverse of cosine is. It's just inverse cosine, right? Or you can also write it, a lot of books write this as arc cosine of x, right? But same thing, right? Okay, so that, again, we're, instead of calling it f inverse of x, we're just going to call it g, same thing, right? It's just another name for it. And the question is to find the, the derivative of g, the derivative of this function, at 1 half. Okay, well, uh, let's see if we can do this directly, right? So by directly, what that means is we would have to take the derivative of the inverse. Oh, let's call it g here, right? g prime of x, right? So that would be the derivative of arc cosine of x. So what is that? Right, so... If you know it, then you, you either had this before or maybe you looked it up in the book, uh, but we're not supposed to know this yet, right? We know the derivative of cosine, of course, is negative sine, but that's not the question, right? right? We're not trying to find the derivative of cosine. We're trying to find the derivative of its inverse. And before you think it's got to be, you know, negative inverse sine, that's not how this works, right? That's not how this property manifests itself, right? So no, it's, it, 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 in fact, it has nothing to do with inverse sine, okay? Again, if, if you happen to look it up. But that's kind of the, the whole point of this is that we don't have to know what this is, right? This is something you will learn how to do very shortly, um, e either because I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do it or uh, you might have to wait till calculus two. So this, when you take calculus two, th this here will be one of the first things you do. Maybe in the first couple of weeks, um, you'll learn how to take the derivative of the inverse cosine or inverse sine function. Um, okay. So 
so yeah, so we're not going to need this. Uh, well, actually, we, we may need this, um, but uh, but 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 not to not to take the derivative of cosine inverse directly. Okay, so so yeah, that's going to be kind of a, a problem here, right? So we're not going to be able to do this directly like we did this problem here. Right? This problem, there was no issue with taking the derivative of f inverse, the derivative of x squared plus 4, right? So here we have a function. We know how to take its inverse. We just don't know how to take the derivative of that function. Okay, At least not yet, right? So, so how do we answer this question then? If we can't find the derivative, then how are we supposed to plug in 1 half? So this is where this property up here is going to be very useful. So let me copy it down so we can, we can use it here. Um, yep. So the derivative of g at x is just going to be the reciprocal, right? So 1 over the derivative of f at g of x. Okay. So this is what we're going to use to take the derivative of g and then plug in 1 half. In fact, we can just do that right now. Um, yep. So we can plug in x equals one half. This is going to be one over, all right, f prime of g of x. So that's going to be g of one half, right? I think that's right. Yep. So right. So what is this? First of all, what is f prime? Okay. So that that you should know, right? f is the original function here. That's cosine. So what's the derivative of cosine? As I already showed you, right, it's negative sine. Right, so, so yeah, this is my, oops, this is my f prime right here. This is just f prime of x, right? All right. So this is just going to be 1 over negative sine of g of 1 half. Right. Now, what's g? Well, g is this function here, right? It's the inverse cosine or arc cosine, right? So let's just write that down here. This is going to be negative sine evaluated at, well, the arc cosine of 1 half. Okay, so what's the arc cosine of 1 half? Well, it would be good, oops, arc cosine. It would be good if you, if you memorize this, but okay. It's, uh, if you don't know it offhand, that's fine. Right? So remember, another way to write this is inverse cosine of 1 half. So this is just a number. In fact, it's an angle. So I'm going to call it theta. It's an angle right? whose cosine, so the cosine of the angle, has to be 1 half. Now, right, there's a lot of angles that have this property, that the cosine is equal to 1 half. So we're spe specifically looking for the angle um, between 0 and pi. So, so there's a lot of angles outside of this range that also satisfy this equation over here, but there's only one between 0 and pi. So how did I get this 0 and pi? Well, if you remember, way back up here, Yep, this was the explicit domain of the original function. So for the inverse function, for the arc cosine, that's going to be the range. That's going to be the angle that we get here. It's got to be between 0 and pi. Make sense? All right, well, let's just draw our little unit circle here. You remember how this goes, right? Right? And remember, the cosine is the x-coordinate, so we're looking for where is x equal to negative 1 half. So that's going to be right up here, and that gives us approximately this angle here, right? starting at 0. So, oh, that's negative 1 half. I'm sorry, we're looking for positive 1 half. Did I? Yeah, positive 1 half. Oops. Okay. Easy fix. Uh, I guess I should have done negative one half, but okay, positive one half is here, and so that's going to be this angle, right? Starting at zero, 
All right, so that should be clear that this is just 60 degrees, right, pi over 3. Um, or if you prefer, 60 degrees, but remember, in math, we prefer radians, so we'll write this as pi over 3, right? So, yep, you should verify that if you take the cosine of pi over 3, you do get 1 half, and therefore, this theta here, the arc cosine of 1 half is pi over 3. So that's... Yep, so now we know that this equals pi over 3, right? Again, looking at the unit circle helps. Um, if you have to draw it, that's fine. Um, right, okay, so so where are we now? Well, so I completely messed this up. Uh, so we're at this stage right here. So let me just copy that down here now. This is still going to be 1 over negative sine of arc cosine or inverse cosine of 1 half. But we just calculated that, All right? The arc cosine of 1 half, this thing right here is pi over 3, All right? So we're just taking negative sine of pi over 3. So you should know the sine of pi over 3. That's the y-coordinate here is square root of 3 over 2. Right? Don't forget the negative in front, right? And so when you take the reciprocal of that, you just get negative 2 over square root of 3. Or if you rationalize the denominator, negative 2 square root of 3 over 3. And there's our answer, right? So the original question was, here's your original function. It's just a cosine function, right? We wanted to find the derivative of the inverse at x equals 1 half. And now we have our answer. It's this number here, negative 2 over root 3 or negative 2 root 3 over 3. Okay. Again, there was no way we were going to get that directly. Remember, we did not know how to find the derivative of the inverse cosine or the arc cosine. But using this property way up here, using this, we didn't have to. We never needed to find, we never answered this question here. But using this property, we were able to find the derivative at x equals 1 half. So... So a little confusing, but again, it's just going through the process step by step, right? Finding the derivative of f and then finding, plugging in the number into the arc cosine function, and that's what we get. Okay, I, I know I go way too quickly here, so it's very dizzying. So let me, let me just go back to the original question here and take a moment, absorb all this, and then I'll sort of scroll down. Well, you can almost see the answer in the bottom right here. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it for a second. Um, and so to, to recap what we what we've done, we, ha we were given the function cosine of x on this particular domain. That's just so that it be just so that on this domain it's one to one. So you can talk about the inverse, the inverse being arc cosine here, right? And the question was to find g prime, so the derivative of g at 1 half, right? So we wanted to find g prime of 1 half. So by using this property, the we just take the reciprocal of f prime of g of 1 half, f prime being, well, the derivative of cosine, right? It's just negative sine. And then g, of course, is the arc cosine function. So we take negative sine of arc cosine of 1 half. So we had to figure out what this is. We did that by looking at the circle, and we found that it's just pi over 3. So we stuck the pi over 3 in for arc cosine. Now i got to scroll down a little bit, right? So we plug that right in here. And when we took negative sine of pi over 3, we got negative square root of 3 over 2. Take the reciprocal, and then you have your answer. So I hope that helps. Okay, I think we have time for one last example, and this is going to be uh, kind of a kind of a difficult one. I think it's in the book. 
Um, I think it's number 98. So it's one of the later ones, which means it's, it's a challenge. Um, but let's, let's see if we can figure this out, right? So we're given a function, f of x, and it's defined as this weird definite integral, right? And we, we talked about that before, that you can have a function defined as, as an integral. The idea is you take this function in here, right? And I don't know what to call this because we can't call it little f. Um, and I don't want to call it little g. So, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe we can call it capital F, right? Because it is an, I think it's an antiderivative, right? Yep. So capital F of t is, um, maybe I shouldn't circle it here, is just 1 over, right? Well, it's 1 plus t to the fourth to the power negative 1 half, right? Yeah. So that's my integrand, right? That's the thing that I'm integrating, right? And it depends on t, but when you take the integral and you go from, uh, from 2 to x, then you're getting the area under this curve, and that will depend on where you, where you end up, right? So in other words, if you were to graph this, I'll try to do that again. If you were to graph this function as a function of t here, um, so I'm just trying to think, is this an increasing or decreasing function? And I have to think it's decreasing, right? In fact, uh, yeah. So I think it looks something like this. Yep, because as t gets bigger, the, right, the denominator gets bigger, the fraction gets smaller, right? So it's going to look something like that, right? So if you just plug in t equals 2, if x is 2 here, then you get 0. So we're starting at 2 as sort of our starting point here. And then if this is our x, then we shade in this region here and calculate the area of that region. And that area will be f of x, right? So if you increase x, you increase the area, right? right? So that's the idea. That's what f of x represents. It represents the area, the area under this curve here, right? OK. So we have to show that this is 1 to 1. And in fact, if you look at the graph here, that, that kind of makes sense, right? After all, if I picked a different x, like let's say I call this you know, x1, and way over here is x2, right? So, right? So, in other words, if I find the area from 2 to x1, so I keep changing this, from 2 to x1, um, right? Obviously, x1 and x2 are not the same. And the areas are not the same, right? The area for x2 includes the purple plus the red. But the area for x1 just includes the purple. And right, the purple plus the red is not the, equal to the purple area, right? So, so yeah, this is the definition of 1 to 1, or it's, it's one version of it. Right. So two different x's give you two different areas. That's, that's all it says, right? So it is 1 to 1. Now the tricky part. We want to find the derivative of the inverse function. OK. So. Yeah, so let's see. Can we do this, right? Can we do this uh, directly? So can we find the inverse of f as a function of x? Well, that relies on can we write this in its closed form? Can we evaluate this integral? And I'll tell you right now, that's a very tricky integral to do. Um, this, is not, this is not obvious, right? Um, you know, so in other words, can I do the indefinite integral of 1 plus t to the fourth to the negative 1 half dt? Right. Um, and yeah, maybe I, should, maybe I should just use x here in this case, because it is a function of x at this point. But the answer is no, right? I don't think you can do this. To be fair, to be honest with you, I don't even think I can do this. Um, I would have to think about this pretty hard. Okay. You might say, well, wait a minute. Isn't that just a substitution? Can I just let u be 1 plus x to the fourth? You could try that. You can try it, but it doesn't work, and here's why. 
because the derivative of that is 4x cubed. The 4 is not the issue because we can multiply by 4 and divide by 4. The issue is this x cubed. There is no x cubed in here, right? So, yeah, you cannot just multiply by x cubed on the inside and divide by x cubed on the outside because it depends on x. You could do that with the 4 because it's a constant. You cannot do that with x. So, substitution doesn't work, right? Um, and I don't remember what works. Um, but, so the point is we can't do it directly, right? We're going to have to rely on this version, right? That if you take the inverse, you take the derivative, and then you plug in, you know, any value of x. In fact, I should use a, a different letter here. Um, how about just a, right? That this will be the reciprocal of the derivative of this function, the original function, um, at not a, but at f inverse of a. Okay, and what's our a here, right? Our here, our a is zero, right? So, so if you want, maybe we should change this a to zero here. Um, ah. Okay, so give me a second and I'll see if I can erase the little tail here. Make that a zero and make this a zero as well. Okay. That's a zero and that's zero. All right. Uh, yeah. So, so again, this comes in very handy because there's no way we're going to do this directly. Um, right, because not only... Right. Obviously, it's not just a matter of finding the inverse. Then, if we configure this question mark out, can we take its derivative? But if we don't know what the question mark is, if we don't know the antiderivative, we can't, you know, we can't uh, you know, take its derivative here. We, if we don't know what this function is, we can't take its derivative. Right. So that's that's the question. Right. Um, yeah. But we can take the um, Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, I think I'm confusing myself here. No bollocks. All right, so, okay, I kind of messed this up. Uh, the, the inverse of this function is not going to be the, der the antiderivative, um, which kind of make, I mean, well, it's, it's, yeah. Okay, so this is wrong here anyways. Ooh, right, so that's not going to be right. Um, and it's true, we, we might not be able to evaluate this antiderivative, but that wasn't the question. The question is to find the inverse of this function, and that's definitely not clear. Okay, so not only can we not find the inverse, we can't find its derivative. Okay, all right. So any way you slice it, we can't find the inverse directly, and we can't find, uh, yeah, we can't find the a derivative of that. Um, I mean, look, it's, it's, yeah, so, so here's my confusion, right? Um, I was trying to find f as, by itself. In other words, the only, the only, yeah, the only issue here is that this should not be f inverse. This should just be f itself, right? So I was trying to, I was trying to evaluate this integral to get f, not, not f inverse. But you need f as a, as a function to get f inverse, right? So we don't even know what f is. If we don't know what f is, we have no hope of finding f inverse. That's an even bigger question. Okay, so I hope that helps uh, a little clarify what, what we're going to try to do here. Sorry about that. Uh, but th this, this down here we can do. So let's, let's just do this directly here, right? Or indirectly, rather, using this property. All right, well, what do we need? We need, obviously, the derivative of this. We'll, we'll get that in just a second. But let's get the inside, right? Let's get f inverse of 0, right? Now, I just said we can't find f inverse. So how can we plug in 0 into this unknown function? Okay, so, yeah, so the, the big question here is what is f inverse of 0 when we don't even know 
f inverse of x as a function. Right? So f inverse of 0, if it even exists, is just some number. right? It's just some number. So let's give it a name. Let's call it, um, I don't know, n for number. right? And let's just trace back what this n has to be. Right? The whole idea of the inverse is that it undoes the original function. So this 0, then, has to be f of n. Right? So whatever n is, if we take f of n, we get 0. Now, what's f? f is the original function. It's up here, right? It's this thing. So let me just copy that down. Right? f of n is equal to the definite integral from 2 to n of 1 over the square root of 1 plus t to the fourth dt. So the question is, when does that equal 0? Right, we have to solve this equation here. Right? And you might think, well, that's, that's, that's a tricky equation. It, it involves this definite integral. And we, we already said we don't know what this definite integral is. We don't know how to evaluate it. Right. Think about it for just a second, right? This, this should be obvious, right? This should be completely obvious. If, if you remember what we did in the last couple of videos, um, in particular in, I think it's section 4.4, 4, uh, 4.3 or 4.4, 4, we talked about a particular property of definite integrals. Okay, so let me remind you what that property was. Right? Here it is. If, we're, if we want the definite integral from a to a of any function, any function that's defined at a, this has to be 0. Right? So now think about this. Right? right. If we get the same 0 on the right side, then that, this, this, this has to match on the left side. So how can this match? Right. Well, right, we're going from A to A. That means we have to be going from 2 to 2. Right? But this has to match this, right? From A to A, that means the N has to be 2. So there you go. Right, so that's what... That's sort of what I meant by this is obvious, right? Not, not to make you feel bad if you didn't see it, but, right? So this is how to solve that equation, right? This n here has to be, has to be 2. So f of 2 equals 0, right? Which is another way to say that f inverse of 0 is the number 2. Okay. So back over here, all the way on the left here, that's what the f inverse of, well, actually, we don't know what f inverse of x is, right? This is still unknown. But now we know what n is, right? n is just 2. Sorry, I'm erasing that, but. So yeah, f inverse of 0 is 2. So that's what goes on the inside here. So let's, uh, again, I'm out of space, so let's go down here. So we have that this is 1 over the derivative of f at f inverse of 0, which we just said equals 2. So now we need f prime of 2. Right? So what's f prime of 2? Well, here's the original f. And I guess I should copy it down because, well, I, well, I had it here, but I ruined it. So let me copy it down again, what f of x is f of x is the definite integral from 2 to x of 1 over the square root of 1 plus t to the fourth dt. Okay, so I'm just copying down the original problem, the original f of x, right? So now the question is, how do we take the derivative of this? How do we find f prime of x? Right? In other words, we want to take the derivative of the definite integral from 2 to x of 1 over the square root of 1 plus t to the fourth dt. 
And again, maybe I don't want to say this is obvious. It's not obvious, but but we did talk about this not too long ago. And this was in 4.4. We said the derivative of the definite integral from a to x of any function, I shouldn't call it f, maybe let's call it uh, capital F of t, dt, that this is just capital F of x. Okay, so this is the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Theorem of calculus. Right? And we talked about this in section 4.4. So what is our capital F here? It's the integrand, right? It's this thing in here. So just change the t to an x now. It's 1 over the square root of 1 plus x to the fourth. And that's it. Right? After all, the derivative of the antiderivative, you just get back the original function just plugging in x for t here. Right? All right, now we're almost done. Right? I know we've been through, this is a, I told you this was not an easy one, right? So, yep, not an easy one. But we're almost done. Now we just have to plug in 2, right, to get this. And if x is 2, this is going to be 1 over the square root of 1 plus 2 to the 4th. So 2 to the 4th is 16. And 1 plus 16 is 17. So this is 1 over the square root of 17. Okay, so that's f, f prime of 2. I'll write it again here, f prime of 2. So what we're looking for, though, is the reciprocal. What's 1 over? 1 over the square root of 17. Okay, so I know I'm running out of space here, but I think I can fill this in. This is 1 over 1 over the square root of 17. Well, that should just be the square root of 17. Okay, so... There's our answer. Uh, what is f inver uh, the f prime of f inverse, right? So in other words, the derivative of the inverse at zero, it's just the square root of 17. Okay. Um, again, not an easy one. Like I say, this was number 98, and so it wasn't even for homework. I'd say it's a little too hard for the homework. It's it's a good challenge problem. It's one that I might put like on a, on a challenging problem set, but uh, I don't get problem sets. So, uh, so, so yeah, Ho hopefully, uh, you know, go, go through this again very slowly. I know I've kind of made a mess out of this as I usually do, but, um, you know, go through it one more time and, and see if you can follow um, every step of the way here. Again, the key to doing this is, again, ignore all this stuff because even I messed that up. It's to use this, right? To try to calculate this by using this property here. All right, well, I think we better end it there. Um, we ended on a really, really tough one, but uh, yep, they can't, all, they can't all be super easy. Sorry about that. <laughs>